Our next speaker probably needs no introduction. She's much beloved in Vancouver. Um, for those of you who don't know her, Margaret Gallagher is a host on CBC Radio 1. Um, you've probably heard her on Hot Air or the early edition. But also, Margaret is a huge community advocate. So you've probably also seen her donating her time and efforts to many Vancouver events, such as the Asian Heritage Month, Vancouver International Jazz Festival, the Vancouver Folk Festival, and Havapalooza on occasion. So I don't want to say too much, and I'm just going to hand it over to Margaret Gallagher. Thanks, Anna. I'll try not to spill this. Hang on, I'll put it down. <laughs> I'm likely to spill it. Um, thank you, and thank you so much for all being here. It, I have to say, even though it's become much more common these days, it's still pretty cool to be in a room full of mixies or mixed families, uh, as my brothers and I used to say. Because when I was growing up in rural BC in the 70s, it really didn't feel like there were many of us. Um, the word hapa wasn't part of the vocabulary at all. Um, my parents used to call us Eurasian, and my brothers and also some cousins used to call ourselves Chirish, and that is the simple version. When I was a little kid, I used to say I was half Chinese, half Indonesian, half Irish, half American, and oh, half Canadian too. So obviously, I did not really understand fractions at that point, or concepts of nationality or ethnicity, because I'm the first person born in Canada in my family. I just knew that my family was pretty, was very different from most of the other families we knew. Even our Chineseness, which was the thing that was most often pointed out to us, was confusing and it didn't really fit in with the other Chinese people we met. Um, my mom is ethnically Chinese. She was born in Jakarta. She grew up speaking Dutch first. I actually, I think she grew up speaking Javanese, Bahasa Indonesian, Dutch, and then later English, not Cantonese or Mandarin. And uh, because my grandfather was a diplomat, it meant she lived in Indonesia, Holland, Hong Kong, and New York before heading to an American university where, ironically, um, she played the role of Liat in South Pacific. How many of you know the story? Yes, this is the beautiful Tonkinese girl who tragically falls in love with a white soldier named Joe, who's afraid to marry the girl of his dreams because he fears the bigger tree they'll face back home. Now my dad, whose name happens to be Joe, had had no such fears. Um, he's an Irish-American English lit professor from Boston. And they met while they were both students at Notre Dame, and they bonded over a mutual disinterest in football. And when they got married in 1964, it was a really big deal. Now, my maternal grandparents initially fretted over how difficult it was going to be for the children. However, in the end, my grandfather, who followed Confucius, was very pleased that his daughter was marrying a scholar, and my former Buddhist, now devout Catholic grandmother, was glad that my dad came from a good Catholic family. But <clears throat> their fears were not entirely paranoid, because going back to South Pacific, which was a movie hit not that many years before, the central conflict is about a woman who can't get over the fact that her widower boyfriend has two biracial kids. And in 1964, um, interracial marriage was illegal in about 20 states, including Indiana, which is where my parents got married. Now, I think the law only applied to um, between blacks and whites getting married, but my mom still had to tick a box that said she was white on the marriage application. So it didn't take long for my parents to move to Canada and start having kids. It was the 1960s, and uh, Canada was building a lot of new universities, needed people to teach in them. My parents were excited to move to a country that had beautiful scenery, public health care, and what they thought would be a place with less racial tension. And, and I suppose they were right, um, which isn't to say that racism didn't enter our lives sometimes. I'm going to get a glass of water. Hang on. <clears throat> now, if you look at me today, knowing that my last name is Gallagher, you may not even realize that I'm part Asian. But when we were little, my brothers and I were regularly called things like Chinese checkers, Chinaman, chink, and we were with my dad, he would sometimes get asked if we were adopted, which is pretty funny if you actually look at my dad, who's in this room at the back, because I look a lot like my dad. Um, but I think people could see past our black hair and our apparently slanted eyes. Um, in the early 70s, we used to drive to Bellingham a lot to visit my aunt, and I remember once that our family crossed the border, and the later, there's this car chasing us with sirens going. We're like, well, what is this? 
And it seems like the border cops had second thoughts about letting us in. They wanted to look at our papers. And I think it's that they thought my mom and us were Vietnamese refugees and they were worried that my dad was sneaking us into the country. He was pretty mad. <clears throat> now more often, as I'm sure many of you will relate, uh, people just couldn't figure out what we were. So we used to live in Bradner and we spent a lot of time playing with our friends, the Unraws, who had a chicken farm. And there was a little blonde girl who lived up down the road and she used to stand at the end of the driveway and she would just stare at us. I said, well, why didn't she just come and play? And we were told that her mom told her that she wasn't allowed to play with us because we were Eskimos. And not only did we not believe in God, we might possibly be cannibals. So okay, those are just the stories that stand out. It actually, you know, it wasn't all like that. And, and more often than not, growing up half, it just meant that a lot, you had a lot of questions about where you're from. People think you're Hawaiian, you're Aboriginal, you're Spanish, you're Mexican, and yes, sometimes Eskimo. But, you know, it's this kind of sense of belonging everywhere and nowhere at the same time, but you still recognize each other. So how many of you have developed a half a knot? You know, you walk down the street, you have a little flash of recognition, hey. <laughs> you know, and, and you don't even realize that you do it. I remember I had this boyfriend once, he, he was not Hapa, and he's like, I just saw you do that. You gave that woman a half a nod. I was like, I didn't, didn't even notice. And he was right, because part of me would feel like, well, we're going to be friends. We must have so much in common with that person, which isn't necessarily true. I mean, people have a very different relationship to their mixed identities, as we've heard tonight. And my brother Patrick, who some of you might know as Coach Tanaka and Glee, Attila the Hun and I at the museum, and even, yes, he played an Inuit tech nerd in the um, sci-fi series Borealis. He says it's not a big deal to him. And, but, I would say, who but a Hapa could have played so many ethnicities? And my favorite role he ever played was just like a walk-on. He had no lines, but he was credited as Hispanic cop. <laughs> <laughs> it was in Dark Angel. So these days, I do have to admit, it isn't such a big deal. There are so many Hapas, especially the little kids. I'd be doing my Hapa nod all the time. <laughs> you know, my daughter, she has roots that are Chinese, Indonesian, Irish, American, Palestinian, French Canadian, and British. And unlike me, she is not the only Hapa kid in her school. Far from it. In fact, my daughter went to the same preschool as Anna's kids. But you know what? I still want her to know her roots because it, well, it just gets complicated the more mixed up we become. I mean, sometimes people tell me they don't even think of me as Asian. But I don't want to lose that identity, which isn't to say that I'm ignoring the fact that I'm also part white. I, I want to keep them both, and I want my daughter to have all of it. Um, and I want them to celebrate the fact that, you know, together, we're kind of making something new, and in some ways, we're still trying to figure that out. Because it's really important to keep those threads to tell us where we came from. I think that being happy means that those threads can reach very, very far, um, sometimes to the opposite ends of the world. So this past July, um, a Malaysian Airlines flight was shot down over Ukraine, and on that, on board, all aboard died, including a really lovely, cheerful woman named Nini Kiriani. And she was my great aunt's sister. Now the same week, the news was filled with all sorts of stories about the bloody conflict in Gaza, where my father-in-law is from. And I, shortly after I found about Nini, um, <clears throat> I remember I was biking to Stanley Park. It was a beautiful sunny morning. I was pulling my daughter in the back of the, in the trailer, and she's looking out at the beautiful seawall, and I'm thinking, She's related so quite directly to these events happening on the other side of the world. And, and she's just turned five, so I haven't told her about this. But I do want her to think about what happens around the world and understand how she might be connected. Because I think being Hapa, regardless of where your roots from, means that it's harder to think of people as other. And if there's no other, or at least less fear of it, then perhaps there can be less conflict in the world. And I know that's idealistic, but you know, why not try? After all, some of our parents, to borrow a quote from a song in South Pacific, were cockeyed optimists when they chose to fall in love and face whatever may come. And looking around this room, I would say that it was all worth it. So thank you. Aww.